Welcome to Montgomery Talks. This is our regular podcast on Montgomery County issues. We're doing something a little bit different this week. We're having uh, Dr. Mark Liberto in. He is a veterinarian in uh, Gaithersburg. Yes. Been in practice for over 20 years, right? Uh, it'll be 31 years this year. Wow. And we've got a number of questions we want to ask him about our pets and whatnot. And the first question I've got for you is, what are some of the signs that dogs, or I guess cats, tell us when they're not well? That's a good question. I'm, I mean, obviously, whenever we're interacting with our pets, we see what's normal and abnormal all the time. Now, sometimes it in, works in our favor, sometimes not. I'll give you an example. Say there's a little lump on the dog, and that lump starts to grow. Because you're seeing that lump every day, you may be somewhat less sensitive to the fact that that lump's becoming a problem than when I see it, and I'm thinking, what the heck, what's this thing doing here? When I see a, a pet two, three times a year, that will be much more dramatic for me. And then, of course, depending on where it is, would be might, might mean it's more of a problem. But the biggest things we look for, sleep habits, eating habits, how they go to the bathroom, those habits. So are they, dogs especially, cats as well, animals are routine. They will do the same thing the same way every day and be perfectly happy doing that. They don't need a ton of different variety of disturbances of their routine. And so when we see those disturbances, all of a sudden they're sleeping longer instead of waking up and getting excited about things. Well, it could be pain. Maybe they're getting arthritic, especially if it's in the winter, cold, damp day. They may hurt. Or if all of a sudden they start to vomit. You know, they eat like a champ, and today they're not eating so much, and next thing you know, he's vomiting. Well, that could be a problem. And there are a myriad of causes of those things, some minor, some major. So, But anything that, anything that disturbs the routine. So if you see something that doesn't fit or it's out of normal, that's something that's not right. And I always tell folks, but when in doubt, let's check it out. A good client of mine, if it's a client I see all the time, we usually know what's going on before they even come in the door. So if I hear what the presenting complaint is, say it's the dog won't go up the stairs. Well, I've got a pretty good idea why. Now, if I only see that pet once every five years, which a lot of folks do, they think it's not necessary to bring a pet in. Well, then you're kind of flying on your own then. I won't know. So that becomes a little bit more important to have that pet seen when something doesn't seem right. So there really is a value in doing yearly or twice a year exams because you get to know the pet, you get to know the folks, you know what fits, what doesn't fit, what's normal, what's not normal. So you establish a good routine that way. When something's not right with a pet, <laughs> um, when do we know what we're doing is the right thing to do? Well, I mean, the first thing we always start with, a, you know, when you call in, you start with a presenting complaint. What's the problem? And so our receptionists are trained to go over what those things are. There's certain things that if you say the word, for instance, my cat's going in and out of the litter box a whole lot lately. We want to see that cat, especially if it's a male cat, we want to see that cat today because that's a sign that that cat could be having a urinary obstruction. So that's an immediate thing. Or my dog just urinated blood. Well, that's something we want to see right now. So there are certain phrases, if we hear it, that requires to be seen right away. There's other things that are, that are not that important. So maybe some mild weight loss or weight gain or just not acting right. Then those things we could kind of wait a little bit more to see, but they're not considered an emergency. But a lot of times folks wait too long. I think that's our biggest problem. If we check them out early, we do a, the next step is a good physical exam. 90% of our diagnoses are made on a physical exam. Most folks don't realize that. Everybody puts a lot of dependency on tests, and that's good. The tests are valuable, but 90% of a diagnosis is made on a physical exam. Most of the time, the tests confirm what we're finding on the physical. It's extremely rare that we go fishing for a problem doing tests. It, it, in my mind, if you're doing that, you're probably going to be wandering for a while before you come up with what's wrong. Mm -hmm. And then once you decide a course of action, mm -hmm. how does the owner know that this is the right thing or, or, or something else? Right. I mean, it's so, I mean, with every problem, there's more than one way to fix it many times. Not always, but many times. So say, say if a pet comes in and he's vomiting, and this is new. This is not something he normally does. And they come in, and we have a discussion about it. And he says, yeah, Doc, I gave him a steak bone the other day. Ah, 
Is he used to getting steak bones daily? No. So we were barbecuing and we gave him a steak bone, which is not a good idea. I guarantee you they're going to eat it and love it and they're going to pay for it the next day. So that steak bone enters their system. So we could have a sliver of bone. That dog has a uh, has the power in his jaws to break bone as he's chewing on it. That piece of bone can get swallowed and can maybe lodge in the esophagus or lodge in the stomach or lodge in the small intestine. If the bone's big enough, it may get stuck. It can't pass. Even if it doesn't, that bony material, the body's going to try and digest, and that can cause a lot of inflammation. And so we bring the dog in, take a look, get his temperature, say his temperature's a little high. Well, that's not normal. Normal temperature for a dog is up to 102.8, from about 99.8 to 102.8. So say he's clicking 103.5. I feel his tummy. His tummy's tender. He doesn't like me touching his tummy. I do a rectal exam on him, and my finger comes out with bloody material on it. Uh, He's had maybe some diarrhea. Now that diarrhea is beginning worse. So that's a classic sign of a, ga- a gastrointestinal intestinal irritation. And it, you could pick every organ going down the intestine. So we could start with the stomach. could be gastritis, pancreas, pancreatitis, liver, hepatitis. These are all part of the digestive system. Enteritis, inflammation of the intestine. You have three major parts to the intestine. Any one of those could be involved. The three places where things get stuck is usually trying to get out of the stomach, trying to get into the small part of the small intestine and going from the small intestine to the large intestine. And if it's stuck, it hurts. And those poor dogs are painful and their vomiting gets really bad. So then you got to make a decision depending on the severity of the problem. I mean, if he's just a little irritated, maybe he just needs some medication, an Alka-Seltzer per se, don't ever give a dog Alka-Seltzer, it's bad. Maybe something just to calm things down and that's maybe all he needs. But on the other hand, he may need to go on IV fluids, he may need to get rehydrated, may need some medication, antibiotics, and acid therapy. So uh, sometimes we got to open them up and remove the obstruction. And when does when is cost a, fi- uh, a factor yeah. in this? Because I mean, at least with normal people, we've got insurance, or lots of us have insurance. And m- most people don't have insurance on their pets. No, it's becoming more popular. They say 3% of the pet owning population has insurance, but it's definitely growing. And I'm sure the insurance companies want it to. Cost is always going to be a factor. Um, I mean, I have very few clients that are independently wealthy. So I'm pretty much every time I'm discussing a case with a client, we're going over cost. What's interesting, next time you go to your medical doctor, ask them how much things are going to cost that day. It'd be interesting if you get an answer. They probably have no clue. Why? That's just a question for another time. So, but we always have a discussion on cost. So I put together an estimate. If that's too much for the client, say they can't afford that, well, then there's some things that are really important, things that are less important, and we go over those options. And we do what they can afford and what we can get done, and it's worth doing. There's some things that I would love to do, but are they absolutely necessary? Maybe not. There's other things that are absolutely necessary, and with those, we, if we're going to cut anything out, we're not going to cut those out. So, And it just depends. It's a case-by-case basis. Right. So what about a dog's weight? I mean, how do you know when a dog is overweight or underweight? Right. So a good way to tell is is what we call a body score. It actually is more important than the actual weight. So you should be able to put your hand on the side of the chest of a dog, and without pressing, you should feel every rib. Looking, you should be able just to make out the last few ribs as they breathe in and out. They should have a nice waist to them. If you put your hand on their back and you cannot feel the tips of the spine— then that's not muscle. I don't think the dog's bodybuilding. I think in that case, it's fat that's bulging up, that's covering those spine tips. So you should be able to feel their pelvis. Um, You should be able to feel their neck and feel the bone without pressing too hard around the base of the skull. So when they become overweight, the first sign usually is you put your hand on their chest and you really got to press to feel anything. And that's because you're going through about a half an inch to an inch of fat. Now that's on the outside. On the inside, all that fat's getting deposited in the abdominal cavity and so, not good stuff. So, what's the next step? Uh, put them on a diet or yeah. just exercise I mean, they, more? Well, they can only get what you give them. So, unlike us, which want to break the rules all the time and cheat, the dog can't do that on its own. So, your dog will only get the calories it gets from you. So, if you want to cut them by 25%, you have the power to do it. Mm-hmm. Except when they look at you, those little loving eyes, <laughs> and they want that something that you have. So... 
And what's the deal with chocolate? When I was a kid, yeah. we gave chocolate to our dogs all the time. Nobody's thought yeah. two. Th- it just seems like in the last five or ten years, chocolate's been like the, the, the a poison to dogs. Well, it, it's always been a toxin, but it's the dark chocolate or baker's chocolate that's really the toxic product. Um, milk chocolate, the biggest problem with milk chocolate and those kind of products, it just gives them diarrhea. It causes irritation. But the dark chocolates, all chocolate has uh, theobromines in it. Theobromines are are an amphetamine-like drug. And so with an intoxication of it, literally, they can do anything from become very hyper, have a high blood pressure problem. They can go into seizures if it's severe enough. So it acts like an amphetamine. Okay. And what about CBD? I, I, we've, uh, I have yeah. a, a kind of a hyper dog that we've been trying to calm him down a little bit, especially when we're not home, and we've been s- yeah. experimenting with some of these products. Do you think they're worthwhile? Uh, it's a lot of unknown right now. Right now, I can't even recommend a product to you that I'm convinced that what's in it is in it. So the entire market of, of CBD oils and CBD compounds is in a state of huge flux right now. In the state of Maryland, it cannot even be prescribed legally at this point. So, and that's even products that are based on hemp rather than based on cannabis. So that's changing. That's changing all over the country. And, and recently, there's been some federal guidelines on that that have shown that hemp products are now considered to be okay to use. And we know there are CBD receptors in dogs. There's CBD receptors in people. They're in various places. And what exactly they do is still being delineated. So there's a lot of unknowns there. So are they helpful in pain syndromes? That's what we think it may be. Are they helpful as appetite stimulants? Well, if you talk to anybody who has had an experience with cannabis, they'll tell you it has that effect. So do the CBD oils, which, by the way, do not contain THC, THC is the psychotropic active product in cannabis that causes disorientation, the feeling of being high and all that. Those are not in those products. There doesn't seem to be any therapeutic benefit of anything with THC. But the CBD oils are the big area of unknown, but promise as well. So could they be good in pain, chronic pain syndromes? That's what we think they may be beneficial. Or GI upset problems, they may be beneficial there. Arthritic dogs may be helpful with that. So it's just, it's just so much unknown, it's hard for me to make a recommendation and be absolute that this is going to help you. So I do have a, a fairly frantic dog, mm-hmm. especially when nobody's around. Mm-hmm. Um, so what, anxiety? What, yeah, I, whatever. You yeah. know, he just, he just will find like he's jumped up on a table and right. knocked everything off or whatever. What's the best way to, to try to ca- counteract that? Well, if your dog's destructive— and there's different levels of anxiety. I mean, we get some dogs that literally will try to destroy everything. They'll chew on doors. They'll rip down walls. They'll go through windows. The anxiety is so high, it needs to be treated with pharmaceuticals of some type. So there's different categories of anti-anxiety drugs that we can use, and usually combinations of these meds we can use to kind of get them to a point where they're acceptably not hurting themselves. Mild anxiety many times could be treated with training, just doing behavior training, maybe leaving on uh, a series of music audios that help to calm a dog down. We have that playing in one of our kennels where it definitely makes a difference. Those dogs are chilled. Rock and roll is not the answer for dogs. I say classic mu- classical music and country music seems to be better. But these particular audio visuals have a rhythm to the music that tends to be calming. Now, there's also some supplements that work really good for calming that are more natural-based, herb-type products. And so those could be helpful before you have to go to an actual pharmaceutical product. And if they're really bad, I'd recommend a crate. You You recommend a crate? Yeah, because you want to keep them from doing something that's dangerous. Mm -hmm. Now, there's some dogs that will destroy a crate, and that's not going to work in that situation. Mm -hmm. So we have some dogs that literally have broken their teeth trying to get out of a crate, and they just lose their mind. They don't feel any pain when that's going on. So, okay. Well, now's a good time to take a break. We'll be right back. This is Doug Tallman, senior reporter with Montgomery Community Media, talking with Mark Liberto. MCM, your community media center, is making Montgomery County a great place to live through programs like 21 This Week. Montgomery County's hardest-hitting political talk show keeps you up to date with the local political scene. 
Montgomery Community Media. Our middle name is Community. And we're back with Montgomery Talks, and I'm talking with Dr. Mark Liberto, who runs Lake Forest Veterinary Hospital in Gaithersburg. So a family wants to add a dog to their, um, yeah. to their family. Where do you think is the best place to go? Well, if you want, uh, you know, there's always this question, should I get a purebred dog or not? And there's uh, some people are adamantly against purebreds because there's so many dogs available from shelters. That's a personal decision. I'm not going to tell you one way or the other. There's certain breeds I wish they would not propagate. There's some breeds that have so many medical problems. It would keep me busy for a long time fixing some of those medical problems. And that is, to me, a challenge. But at the same time, I know some of these poor breeds, they're just, they're miserable all the time. So the shelters are great to go to, but you have to be careful. Don't be trying to adopt every dog you see. There's a limit to what you can take care of. And don't adopt ones that have obvious big problems. Don't try to take on more than you can chew. When you adopt from a shelter, you could adopt a problem, a dog that has a behavior problem or a medical problem. So it's up to the shelter to vet those dogs and be able to give you a good, honest opinion on what their condition is and what their problems are. And as long as you go in with your eyes wide open and you adopt a dog, say a dog that happens to have a urinary problem, it forms urinary crystals, and you know it's going to have to be on a special diet the rest of its life. That's great. That's something that's completely manageable. But if you adopt a dog that has a hemophilia problem or a genetic disease, or a series of problems where it has ocular disease and the eyelids roll in and it causes pain and discomfort all the time, that dog's going to need surgery to correct that. Or has glaucoma, which would eventually require surgery as well. Those folks need to know that. Some shelters are better at showing that. Some others are not. Sometimes you, what I always recommend, no matter where you get a dog from, whether you buy it from a breeder, whether you go up to Lancaster in the Amish country, and there's a lot of folks breeding dogs up there now. Some of those dogs are great, but always get the dog checked within two to three days of adopting it. Don't wait. If you're going to find a problem, let's find it real soon. Then you know what you have to do, had to have to deal with. And there's some of them that are so bad, the situation's so bad, you know, we've had folks bring a dog back to a shelter because of, they just had, were completely unaware dog had some issues or another that were, that were pretty severe. I've always been curious about rescues mm. because um, the couple of times that we've lo mm -hmm. looked for a dog and gone through rescues, it's interesting how they all seem to charge the same amount of money. Yeah. Um, now, granted, you'd understand that if, if, you're, if, if every dog needed to be spayed or neutered, that would make sense. But, right. But we've been spaying and neutering for— 50 years, some percentage of the dogs that are out there, even in rescues, ought to have been already spayed and already neutered. Wouldn't well, you think? There's a lot of um, irresponsibility in that realm. There's so many folks that don't think their dog needs to be spayed or neutered. We still, we still are battling that. So I don't know if that battle will ever be over. We do a lot better than what we did. But there's, a, uh, for instance, a lot of these dogs we see now coming up from uh, the Tennessee area or Kentucky area through various rescues. Most of those dogs are not spayed and neutered. So there's other areas where that's, that is the case. So there's a series of costs involved to bring a dog into a shelter, get it up to date on vaccines, make sure it's clear from heartworm disease, make sure it has no intestinal parasites, no external parasites, fleas and ticks, clean that dog up, and then put it on some of the medications or the prophylactics it needs to be on to maintain good health. And that costs money. Now, some of the shelters get donations from some of the big companies that provide some of these things, and they can operate a little lower cost. Some of them are assisted by their county government, and that helps them out there too. So I would say the average cost to adopt a dog is about $100 to $150. That's really a pretty good bargain for a dog that comes most of the time already housebroken and with most everything done. So um, it's allergy season. Yes. And it affects dogs just like it does people, right? But differently. So when a person gets an allergy, what's the signs? Sneezing, coughing. Right. All respiratory, right? Eyes tearing, that's the biggest thing. When dogs get an allergy, they're not going to sneeze. They're not going to cough. Their skin breaks out. Their skin is their allergic responsive organ. So you see rashes. They start itching like crazy. They start tearing their skin up. Next thing, they'll get infection in the skin. So it's the skin that responds in dogs. 
Sometimes the eyes will be involved with it too, but primarily it's the skin. So you get ears, ear infections will be secondary to allergies. So, and right now tree pollen has just gone off scale. So we go through certain seasons. In the wintertime, it's really mold spores. The springtime, tree pollen first, grass pollen second, weed pollen third, now we're getting into the fall, and then you're back to the mold spores. Plus there's the in-house stuff, dust mites. Some dogs are allergic to cats. Some dogs, I think, are allergic to people, so and vice versa. So now there's some really great new products to deal with allergic disease. So years ago, we, we had really only prednisone, steroid therapy. It works, but it has a lot of bad side effects, especially when you use it long term. Short term, pretty safe. Long term, not good. Now we have monoclonal antibodies that we can use in dogs that help a lot of dogs really get to a point of relief. There's immune therapy where you desensitize them. That's what people do. Uh, go in and get a shot every couple of months. Well, in dogs, we either could do uh, injections or an oral therapy to try to desensitize the body to stop responding to something. And then there are some medications now that are avail available by pill that really breaks that itch cycle. Shampoo therapy that helps. And most of these require a combination of things. It's a dance. And it's whoever actually does the combination of things for that pet in the right amounts that gets them to a nice manageable place. But as soon as you let everything go, many times and until you're out of the season that's bothering that particular patient, those signs are going to come right back. So what's the easiest way to trim a dog's nails? Have your veterinarian do it. <laughs> it's better with two people rather than one unless you really have got a dog that you train well. But I got to tell you, even the best dogs in the world which I think I've had two of, they still don't like it. They just don't like it. It's a real trust thing for a dog to have somebody hold their foot and take something that's a cutting instrument and cut their nail. So you never want to quick them when you're training them. That's a term that indicates that you cut deep enough to actually elicit some bleeding. Mm -hmm. There's also a little nerve there. That's why they don't like it. So if you have somebody holding them still, there's less chance you make that mistake. If it's a white pale colored nail, you can see the red of the blood supply. Don't get too close to it. If you don't, you got to guess. And that's where it gets a little tricky. So just never be greedy in the nail trim. You can always go back and take more later. But if you chop them and it causes, you know, them to not feel good about the whole event, that's going to sensitize them for the next event. So everybody's seen people with emotional support dogs and emotional support pets. Right. And, and you always wonder, how, how serious is it that a person needs a, an emotional support? Yeah. Are, they, are they, do you think they're legitimate or do you think they're... Uh... Well, now you're kind of getting out of my swim lane on this one because <laughs> uh, I'm not a psychiatrist, nor a psychologist, nor proclaimed to be. But I don't know. I really, it's really up between a physician and their patient or, a, you know, a psychiatrist and their patient. What I do know is this. We have autistic kids that will come by the animal hospital. And I've seen magic occur between a dog and an autistic child. A child that was non-vocal all of a sudden starts talking to the dog. Or a child that is so introverted that they won't look at anything will interact with the dog and open up. So there's something that, there that's really good and special. If someone can get off medication, I know a lot of folks that have PTSD that have been in the service and have PTSD, and that dog is their best friend right now. And that's a lot better than being on a ton of medication. So I would be 100% for all those things. But that's really, I, I, who am I? I? I don't know. Everybody get a dog. It helps anyhow. Right. <laughs> do you do know that that's true, though, that folks that with pets tend to live longer and healthier lives? They're usually overall on less medication, and their level of stress and anxiety is less. They've done that. Every study they've done has shown that time and time again. And guess what's the best one? Dogs or cats? What do you think? Oh, dogs. Yeah. Dogs seem to be a little bit more in a positive there. Although cats run a real close second. So, And birds are number three. So there is a benefit to owning a pet, other than just having to clean up after them. Yeah. This is a good question to end on. Um, our pets don't live forever. Right. What's the best way to... Uh, send them off to the Rainbow Bridge. Yeah. So the end of life issues are always difficult. And, you know, every week, every week, uh, maybe a, we'll pass a week every now and then, but typically every week we have to euthanize a pet. And usually because of a combination of age and disease. Age itself is not a disease. 
and I'm a living example of that. I'm 59, I'm not dead yet. So just because they're old doesn't mean they necessarily have a problem. But there are some problems that are more common when you get old. So arthritic disease is a big problem. But we have a lot of things that we didn't have not even five years ago that we can make an arthritic dog feel really comfortable. And that goes for cats, too. There's a lot of arthritic cats out there that are way underdiagnosed. Cats that sometimes develop a bad attitude after being a sweet cat for the longest time, especially when you try to touch them. A lot of times those cats are painful. We just don't know it. They're not going to tell you, so maybe one day one will talk to me, but it hasn't happened yet. It really comes down to quality of life. Are they having a good quality of life? If they're so painful they can't get out to go to the bathroom when that's something they absolutely always do, and all they do is sit and they start to urinate and defecate on themselves, you're there. That's You maybe are past there. So it comes down to pain, whether we could help with the pain or not. And there's other issues that could be, you know, we have dogs with cancer that sometimes we have great responses with the chemotherapy and controlling that cancer afterwards with what we call metronomic chemotherapy and some real good successes there. But it comes down to quality of life. If they're suffering, then it's, you know, then you have to make a call. So I would always ask your veterinarian, honestly, do you think he's suffering? Clients, because sometimes they're so close, won't see something that's obvious. So that could be tough. But it's, it's never easy. But it's, it's a blessing to be able to end their suffering before it gets too bad. So. Do, do you suggest cremation or what? Afterwards, yeah. I mean, we, I, personally, I bury my dogs. But I have a 56-acre farm, so I have the opportunity to do that. But it's really therapeutic to dig a grave for, my, for a pet. It really is. It's, a, it's an act of closure. I way underestimated the value of that before. But um, so most folks don't get that opportunity. I believe in Montgomery County, I think it's illegal to bury your pet on your own private property unless you have a certain amount of land. So don't go out there and do that unless it's okay. So cremation services are abundant. There's several ones in the area. They're very reputable. So the big question is, if I send my dog off for cremation, is it my dog's ashes I get back? So the ones we work with, we make sure that's definitely the case. How do you test that? There are a couple different ways, but to give you an example, we had a dog one time, the body went for cremation, two weeks went by, we didn't hear anything. The messages got confused. They thought it was a general cremation, which is they bury the ashes at the site, they don't return the ashes. And we called them up and asked them and they were very honest about it. Now, they could have returned ashes from who knows whatever, I would have never known, nor would the owner. So. So it's just the integrity of the company you have to trust on that. Okay. Well, on that happy note, I think it's a good time to stop. This has been Montgomery Talks, your regular podcast on Montgomery County issues. Our guest today was Dr. Mark Liberto of Lake Forest Veterinary Clinic in Gaithersburg. Our engineer today was Ben Romero. Our executive producer is Gaynell Evans. I'm Doug Tallman. We'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm.